Ruchem Aboyim. Welcome to our home. And uh, again, uh, thank you very much for attending. Tonight, our lecture is going to be called uh, The Morning After. So tonight, in my thoughts, I would like to examine the story of Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, our father, and how it was that he married two sisters at the same time, which according to the laws of the Torah is prohibited. We could answer that this event occurred well before the giving of the Torah on the top of Mount Sinai. Still, we have a tradition that our forefathers kept all the laws of the Torah, even rabbinic ordinations, such as making an Eruv. An Eruv is an action which entails enclosing an area so that one is permitted to carry within its boundaries on the Shabbat. Now, many years ago, when my son was 13 years old, so we decided to make his bar mitzvah party in the backyard of our home. My wife is originally from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, probably Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So we had many of out of, out of town relatives that attended. It happened that my brother-in-law, who was not religious at all, stayed at our house for the weekend. He was a very successful lawyer in Philadelphia. In fact, actually in addition to the fact that he, had, he was an accomplished individual. Over the bar mitzvah weekend, it seemed like every time that I was looking for him, I found him in my library. He was reading the Living Torah, a book written by Rabbi Aryu Kaplan on the five books of the Torah. You know, I found it quite amusing. I jokingly made a comment about his religious diligence. He replied that the book of the Torah was amazing. He said it was like reading a soap opera. He was captivated by the narrative, the creation of the world, the creation of man and woman, the incident with the snake, sibling rivalry, murder, he was hooked. He couldn't put it down. The funny thing was, I actually sent him home with a copy. I thought, a thought came to my mind that if you think about it, in reality, the Torah can be viewed as us taking a journey back in time, looking back at our family tree. We begin with the patriarch of our family, Adam, and then we read about Noah and the flood. From there, the narrative slows down. And we are introduced to Avram, Abram, our father. He would later have his name changed by God Almighty to Avraham, Abraham, an acronym for Avhamon Goyim, a multitude, a father of a multitude of nations. You know, we read selective stories about the family and their journeys. And like all families, there are issues. But reading about their problems and their solutions serves as a directive for us to navigate the challenges that we all face in our daily lives. Our ancestors were most certainly superstars, but in the end, they were not perfect. They were all human beings, faced with all the many challenges that living a life presents. That being the case, let us see what we learn from the story of Yaakov Vino, Jacob our father and his marital challenges. Now from the first moment that Yaakov saw Rachel at the well, he fell in love with her. As, a sto as it states in the portion of Vayetze, Vayehav Yaakov es Rochel, that Yaakov loved Rochel. He proposes an offer of marriage immediately to her father, Lovan. He told him that he would work for seven years so that she would become his wife. Lovan agrees, and his ter Torah tells us that the years pass quickly for Yaakov as he anticipates his upcoming marriage to his beloved Rochel. He doesn't trust his father-in-law, Lavan. He's concerned that he might devise some scheme so that Yaakov would take Loa, Leah pardon me, as a wife instead of taking Rachel. The Sefer Olam Rabba states that the two of them were twins. Taking no chances, Yaakov and Rachel agreed upon three signs that they would secretly pass between themselves. That way he would be certain that the woman under the heavy veil at the wedding ceremony was really Rachel. Now the Talmud in the Tractate of Megillah states that when Leah was being brought into the wedding canopy, Rachel said, you know, now my sister will be put to shame. So she got up and she gave Leah the three signs that Yaakov had given to her. There is an obvious question, of course, that has to be asked. Why would Lavan feel a need to give Yaakov Leah instead of Rachel? The Psyche de Rev Kahuna states that Lovan felt that Leah was barren 
and therefore he would find it difficult to find her a husband. It may also have been that Lavan, being an evil person that he was, wanted to create a scenario where Bayakov Avino would feel compelled to marry two sisters, something which Lavan may have known was a Torah prohibition. As I mentioned previously, marrying two sisters is a Torah prohibition. So how was it that Yaakov Avinu decided to marry both Leah and Rachel? So one answer given is that though the forefathers kept the whole Torah, it was voluntary. It did not become an obligation upon the Jewish nation until they accepted the Torah on Mount Sinai. Now other commentaries state that the forefathers kept the Torah only in the land of Israel but not outside of the land. Well, that would have justified Yaakov's action since he married them both outside the land. There are those who say that the fact that Rachel died shortly after the family actually entered the land of Israel was seen to prove this theory. We should learn a great lesson from Yaakov's actions. You know, one can take stringencies upon themselves, but they should not burden their family with them. In fact, the Arizal stated that one should take upon themselves only one mitzvah and perform it with all of its stringencies, whereas with all other commandments in the Torah, that, that they should simply follow the normative approach that is stated in the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law. So since Yaakov's acceptance of the laws of the Torah was his personal choice, he felt that Rachel's sacrifice of giving up the passwords so that her sister Leah would not be embarrassed under the wedding canopy, trumped his stringency. In verse 23, it begins with the words, Vayehi ba'erev, and it was in the evening. The Hebrew word Vayehi, and it was, most often than not, alludes to something negative. In our story, it alerts us to the fact that Lovin would hatch his nefarious scheme that night. Also, the Hebrew word Vayikach, and he took. Well, this word Vayikach was also used in the narrative of the Akedus Yitzchak, of the binding of the Yitzchak, where Abravino, Abraham, our father, had to force his hand to take the knife in order to slaughter his son Yitzchak, since the mitzvah entailed just bringing him up to the altar, not killing him. Here, too, the same term is used, Vayikach, since Lovin had to force Leah to participate in this ruse. It was not her idea. However, you sh she could not disobey her father, since he was a difficult and a, a very powerful man. Verse 25 continues, and it says, Vayhiba Boker, Vinei Leah. And it was in the morning, and it was Leah. This was said by Yaakov of Vina. Well, one can only imagine Yaakov's shock and dismay. He thought that he had just spent his wedding night with Rachel, only to find Leah in the marital bed. What I find strange is that the narrative continues with Yaakov complaining to Lovan. By Yomer el Lovan, Mazos Asiti Li, and Yaakov says to Lovan, What is this you have done to me? And then Yaakov continues and says, Velomer Remisani. And he says to him, Why have you beguiled me, fooled me? One would have thought the Torah would have recorded an emotional conversation before this conversation between Yaakov and Leah. Why was there no mention of any words spoken between them? So one can only imagine her trepidation. How could she have slept that night? She had to be wondering what Yaakov's reaction would be in the morning when he would realize that he had been duped. He did not marry the love of his life, Rachel. Well, she braced herself for the worst. After all, he could have just as easily divorced her. Well, the question we have to ask is, why didn't he? There's another measure that states that since Yaakov was a prophet, he was told by God Almighty that Leah had become pregnant from their first intimacy. This was a sign for him that their union was sanctioned by God Almighty himself. But still, the Torah in verse 31 testifies, Vayar Hashem ki sina Leah, and God saw that Leah was hated. That being the case, the verse continues and says that God opened her womb, referring to Leah, and that Rachel was barren. The words of this verse seem to indicate that initially Leah was barren. So though the Torah does not record anything that, that was said between them, there may well have been words spoken. She had, she had what to say. 
the commentaries tell us that people were saying that the eldest son of Yitzchak would marry the eldest daughter of Lavan. Leah said to Yaakov that since he had bought the birthright from Esau, he became therefore the eldest and it was his only proper that he should marry her. Another reason given by the gracious rabbi was that she had told him that she had learned from his actions. She said that there are times in life when one must be devious in order to achieve their purpose, much like what he had done when he dressed up like his older brother Esau. His intent was to be able to deceive his blind father into blessing him instead of Esau, his older brother. Hearing her words, there was nothing that he could say to her. After all, she had acted with righteous intent. So with no other alternative, he took his complaint directly to love him. Now, in hindsight, she may well have been better served and a lesson for us to learn by just saying that she had no choice. She could have said that she had been forced to do so by her father and left it at that. However, when she included the other reasons, especially that she had learned from his action in conjunction with his relation with his brother Asa, this answer, though true, did not sit well with Yaakov. After all, no one likes to hear that they have been outwitted by their own actions. Though her, ruse aroused, though her ruse aroused negative feelings within Yaakov, he was forced to agree that her decision was correct. Still, this raises an interesting question. In Jewish law, it is forbidden for a husband to have marital relations with his wife if he hates her. Yet we see that initially, Leah bears Yaakov four sons. Now, if he truly hated her, how could he have, had, could have continued to have relations with her? To radically, it would have been forbidden. I think from this scenario, we learn something about human nature. In his heart of hearts, <clears throat> Yaakov knew that what Leah had done was correct. Yaakov may not have consciously realized it, but he may well have borne a certain resentment against her. The Torah states in verse 30 that he loved Rachel more than Leah. It does not say that he hated Leah, just that he loved Rachel more. Nowhere in the Torah does it actually state that he hated Leah. That statement was recorded by God Almighty himself. Leah does not mention the fact in verse 33 where she states, pardon me, Leah does mention the fact in verse 33 where she states, Ki anochi, that I am hated. Rashi mentions there that she was a prophetess. And so she heard this fact directly from God. That was why she called her second son Shimon an allusion to God's Shema, hearing her pain. As we know, God is able to read our deepest thoughts and desires, feelings that we bury so deep in our subconscious that we don't even realize that they exist. So I believe that unbeknown to Yaakov, he carried a certain deep-seated resentment against Leah. However, whatever those negative feelings were over time, he was able to reconcile his emotions and accept the fact that even though she was not his first choice, she was evidently God's first choice. As we see, she was not only his wife in life, but also in death, since it is Leah who was buried with Yaakov in the Machpelah in Hebron. I would think that this single fact alone proves that their relationship grew as time went on into one predicated on love and respect, not hatred. You know, based on Jewish law, we can prove that this had to be the case. Since there is a Torah law that one cannot be buried next to someone who you hated in your lifetime. This law even requires that if two people who hated each other in their lifetimes are accidentally buried next to each other, one of the bodies has to be exhumed and reburied elsewhere. Leah acted in much, in much the same fashion as Tamar, who seduced her father-in-law, Yehuda. She did so with perfectly righteous intent. The Torah does not criticize Tamar for her actions. In fact, she is complimented. She wanted to be a part of Malchut David, the kingship of Dovinamela, the Davidic dynasty. So too with Leah. Nowhere in the Torah do we read that Leah was criticized for her actions. Just the opposite. God blessed her actions. 
we see that she gives birth to six sons, half of the tribes of Israel. Her descendants would serve not only as the kings of Israel, but also as the priests and the members of the Sanhedrin, the high supreme court. Her other three sons were seen as the ultimate Baal Tshuva, school teacher and philanthropist. <clears throat> she even merited that Mashiach Zikeno would be one of her descendants. <clears throat> Excuse me. God may well have orchestrated this whole scenario with Leah for Yaakov's benefit. Now he, Yaakov, would experience some of the same pain and anguish that he had caused to both his father and his brother when he deviously stole Esau's blessings. There can be no greater lesson learned than when we learn in life as to when we find ourselves in the same dilemma that we have put someone else in. As the saying goes, all that goes around comes around. He had duped his father and brother, and now he'd experience a similar scenario with the incident concerning Leah. Well, guess what? The same scenario would repeat itself once again with the story of the brother selling Yosef into slavery to, to Egypt. Then his sons deceived him, just as he had deceived his father. There are no accidents in life. The Talmud tells us that God judges a tzaddik, the chutzaru, to a hair's breadth. The feelings that he experienced after he was deceived by Lovin may well have helped him to both recognize and acknowledge the pain that he had caused his brother Esau. This may well have been a major influence on how he approached his meeting with his brother after 34 years. As Hillel states in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. Do not contemn your fellow man until you have stood in his place. He now understood exactly how his older brother must have felt after he had stolen his blessing, since now he too had been deceived. So he approached their meeting with a greater sense of sensitivity than he might have done previously. <clears throat> he had not been deceived by Lovan. Asaph had come to meet him with thoughts of violence. After all, why did he need 400 men as a welcoming party to greet his younger brother? Yaakov's sensitivity to his brother's feelings managed to turn what could have been a disaster into an amicable encounter. As the saying goes, better an insincere peace than a sincere war. So once again, we learn many lessons from the lives of our ancestors. From Yaakov we learn that Derech Ed Eretz Kodnal the Torah. Proper behavior precedes the study of Torah. Also, once you not burden others with your personal stringencies. In addition, that, that nothing is an accident. Through his marriage to Leah, he learned what is stated in the Talmud and Sota, that each one of us has a beshert, that person whom God has chosen for us to marry, our lifelong partner. In Yaakov's case, it was Leah. We learn an important lesson from their marriage. As married couples, we may not always agree, but a spouse who sees the world differently than we do creates the possibility for us to grow on all levels. If we were both the same, there would exist the possibility that we would become dogmatic and stifle any chance of personal or spiritual elevation. We also learn as the states in the Talmud of Nesota that a second marriage is your mazel, the woman who you choose, a choice that Talmud states reflects who you are, who you deserve. In this case, Yaakov's second choice was Rachel, which was a true complement and reflection of who Yaakov was. Now from Rachel we learn just how far one should extend themselves to save, save another person from being embarrassed. From Leah we learn that even though it may look hopeless, one should never give up. There was no way for her to marry Yaakov, and yet we see that there is a God who runs the world. Just maybe, just maybe that is the greatest lesson that we take away from this story. There is a God who runs the world. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming of Shia to Canaan quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. I hope you found the lecture interesting. Again, God should bless you with only good. Any comment that you'd like to make, please do so on the on the YouTube. I'd be happy to see it and or to my website. Again, God should bless you with health and happiness and success. Again, with all that is good. Shabbat Shalom and 
Keep the lights burning. I wish everybody a happy Hanukkah. As Hanukkah will be this week. Thank you and God bless.